Uh, it's an, I think it's an easy access one. It's got a little bit of history of him. Uh, and, of course, in English. Uh, you can read a lot of them in French. He was born in 1912, so he uh, was an adult during World War II. And uh, one of the things he did, he died uh, at the end of the last century, 1994. Uh, but one of the things that he did was he hid Jews. He was one of those people that uh, hid Jews. Uh, during the war. Um, and like uh, a, a lot of people in uh, France, they had, uh, there was an interest in things spiritual. Uh, and um, to some extent, interested in, uh, in uh, religion as organized and dogmatic and so on and so forth. I mean, that was kind of what they were brought up in. Remember, he's 1912, so he's. He uh, doesn't really know World War I, but he's growing up in, in between the period. And uh, before World War I, early in the 20th century, many people in, uh, in Europe were, uh, thought that the answer to uh, this whole industrial world that was developing and capitalism, the answer to the suffering was, was communism, Marxism. Uh, but by the end of World War II, with uh, uh, communist Russia, which was trying to live this out, and said, well, maybe not so much, but the idea of, uh, of socialism, of uh, kind of coming together, the government had to somehow figure out how to help people better than just not think about it. Uh, so he's uh, growing up in this period where where does... Where does religion fit into this whole problem? We've had just had two world wars. Europe's trashed. France is trashed. Uh, this is an issue, I suppose, with uh, drinking coffee. But so he did have faith in God. It wasn't as if they, it wasn't a, they were not nihilist. These people they had faith in God. But what was their relationship? to God, and I think for him the important thing was the phenomenology of his life is no intermediaries. That's really what was he felt was a key for him uh, in terms of his relationship to God because he had, in his teenage years, he had what, what you might call what he called a, a uh, personal experience the existential moment of uh, somehow a direct contact with the divine. Um, and there was no intermediary for it. He was just a teenager. So a couple of things come out of this, um, I think, for us is, obviously as a teenager, he doesn't have that much background in organized religion or dogma and so on and so forth. But, um, so he has, he has basic beliefs and all, and it wasn't as if he was pursuing something with great fervor as a teenager. It's just that he had this, uh, what might be called in uh, Eastern traditions, sudden enlightenment. Sudden enlightenment is something that can happen to you without a long preparation. Uh, it just is an experience that you have of what you might call the divine. And you could spend the rest of your life trying to put it into words. What, what is this thing? But it's something that's beyond words. It's something that's in all beyond, almost beyond concepts. And you spend your life trying to talk about it and trying to explain it, knowing that it's, it's beyond anything you can talk about. Um, so, but this, is, this was what was important to him, and uh, he felt that, um, that you couldn't necessarily get that by going to church. It wasn't as if he was against church, it's just that his experience didn't seem to need, I mean, he's Catholic, he didn't seem to need sacraments or organized religion or the mass for it, and how that would fit in and so on and so forth is uh, something else. 
Um, but I'm going to go take a little bit of a side here to, um, and then come back to his personal experience of uh, what might have happened. There's a fellow named Ram Das. Be here now. All right, us old people remember. Be here now. He wrote it in 1978. And it's, it's, it, maybe they put out new editions, but the one that I had, it, it was on kind of newspaper. That was the paper, like newspaper. And you didn't open the book this way, you opened it this way. And it had all kinds of uh, pictures of, uh, just all kinds of, you know, I would say that, that weird pictures. <laughs> but I felt that the guy had something good to say. Be here now. Well, Ron Das wasn't always Ron Das. He was a Jew named uh, Richard Alpert. And Richard Alpert uh, taught psychology at Harvard. PhD guy. In the so he's in the 1960s. And who else is there? A fellow named Timothy Leary, also with the PhD teaching psychology. Now, Leary is over into uh, practicing LSD and stuff like that, which was all legal then, because it was all new. I mean, there was no law saying you couldn't do this stuff. We don't know what it does. I mean, he's doing the mushrooms <laughs> and the LSD, and then he's got kind of experiences. So it's his origin. He's trying to try this stuff. So um, Richard does. And it, he has this, uh, uh, well, experience, <laughs> all right, from it, in which he has his sense is uh, everything is one. Everything is interconnected. And it's so different from any way that he could think in his uh, more sober conscious moments without drugs. And so he has this powerful experience and uh, taking pills and stuff like that. And then when the experience is over, boom, he's back to where he was. So in other words, he has this, this very different experience that he realizes the human condition can access this sense of oneness of the universe. But once you come down, you're, you're still the same old guy. And nothing else has changed in your life one way or the other, except maybe now you know that the way you're consciously thinking on a daily basis is only a tiny bit of what could possibly happen. But he neither can hold on to it without drugs, nor is he a better person because of the experience. He's just different. So uh, as, as Larry goes on doing this stuff, Richard Albert discovers or reads or learns or knows about meditation. Meditation is, is uh, in the Eastern traditions, because back in the 60s, if you were looking for meditation in the uh, uh, Christian tradition, it would be very hard to find. It's been the meditation that doesn't have reading books or thinking thoughts, something deeper. And of course, you're looking back in the 40s, uh, and 50s, remember Thomas Merton is just coming out in the United States in the late 40s, early 50s, talking about his, his um, uh, transformation, his going into the Trappist, and his interest in contemplation, whatever that is. So he's a Catholic monk talking about this stuff. What's he talking about? Silence and solitude. We go to Mass and Latin and so on and so forth. Well, that's about where we were. So over in Europe, uh, things aren't too much better. So, um, uh, but the East, Hinduism, Buddhism, and stuff like that, we're talking about some kind of meditation that would, you would have a different experience. What's that all about? So he goes to uh, India, Richard Albert, uh, Jockey Lil. He goes to uh, India, and he starts looking around for gurus. And he finds various gurus, and he asks them questions, and learns from them, and so on and so forth. But somehow, it's just, he's not making the connect. And he has to have a translator going along with him. And 
So finally, here's about one more guy up in the mountain someplace. Not easy to get to. Maha Rishi Chi. And uh, so he said, I'll give it another shot. So he goes up and he finds Maha Rishi Chi, who apparently has uh, got pretty open office hours because he gets there and he's ready to chat with them. And so um, what, what Richard had learned is as soon as you take these pills, uh, you're going to have a trip. Hopefully it's a good trip. It's going to have a trip. And your mind is going to get flipped and so on and so forth. But of course, as Timothy Leary, when his stuff showed this, some people have very bad trips. In any case, so he <laughs> tells the Maharishi Ji, he's got these pills that really get your mind feeling like you're one with a star and so on, in the sky and so on and so forth. So he, he asks if he wants one. So Maharishi Ji takes four. He takes four. One, it just sends you to the moon. He takes four. And he takes them back. He takes them all at once. And so now Richard's waiting for this guy to completely get blown away. And, you know, just that crazy. And Maharishi Ji just sits there. He sits there and sits there. And then Albert realizes this guy, the drug, works on the mind that is nowhere near this capacity for non-dual experience. But if, through your meditation, you are already there, the pills don't do anything for you. They don't affect you at all, because you've already made the move. And he realized meditation was the key. So he wasn't said, and he got the name Ram Das of Maharishi Ji. He gave the name Ram, God. Ram Das, God loves. And he said, that Ram Das, okay, it's my name, Ram Das. And uh, he goes back and he begins this uh, deep meditation because he learned from the East. He wasn't going to learn it from the West, uh, at least he didn't think so. Burton didn't have to figure it out for himself pretty much. So he practices this, and that brings him around to eventually becoming this teacher of meditation, uh, and writes the book, Be, Be, Here, in the Moment, and Be Here Now, How to Be Centered. And centered is a word that Thomas Keating uses in terms of centering prayer. and. Uh, I think the West is moving along on this. So Ram Das is uh, still around. Uh, and uh, there's this fellow, uh, Comedy Sex God is the title of the book. Comedy, no commas. Uh, Comedy Sex God. And this guy's been on the late night television, the stand up comic. And uh, he was brought up in Christian fundamentalism. His name escapes me at the moment. Um, but not the title of the book. And he writes about going from fundamentalist Christianity over to meeting Ram Das. And uh, how his life has changed in terms of his idea of God, Godness, presence, and so on and so forth. Now, he uses some F words, and so I'm not saying you should read the book, but uh, yeah, I found it to be you know, a little bit funny, but very profound, moving from fundamentalist Christianity and trying to convert people. And remember, he's a comic, so he can make fun of himself as well. Now, I never stay up for late night television, so I don't, I really don't know anything. Um, uh, but it's, <clears throat> it's that idea of moving from where you are, Jacques Duell, teenager having this experience, to something much deeper, which we'll get into. Now, <clears throat> You could um, you could read uh, Ken Wilber if you want, but that could hurt your head. <laughs> He's tough. He just wrote. I read it during the summer at the monastery. It took about a month and a half. Um, Seven hundred pages, and you have to read the footnotes. They're really really good. Seven hundred pages of the religions of tomorrow. 
And if you haven't read his earlier books, Integral Psychology, Integral Spirituality, that's okay, because he re-explains it all in 700 pages. Well, when this lady is thinking about integral this and integral that, what he's trying to do, I think, is this sense of bringing things together. How do we move from where Jacques Lel is when he's this teenager to a more evolved person? <clears throat> and uh, it's got to do with meditation. But Ulal, I think, Matthew, Ken Wilbur brings up something that very important. You get a lot of my monastery this, so I'm talking about phenomenology. It's my phenomenology. So um, he speaks about something which I think is very important. And I think we saw it, in, if you were here in Boulder in the late 70s and early 80s, you might have experienced some of this. You can become a guru. Uh, that is, you have a deep sense of uh, it's a sort of spiritual how, how you somehow change spiritually if you will your innards um, your sense of unity, your sense of oneness in the universe through meditation it says but, it, but you so you awaken he calls it, you awaken to uh, what Richard Alfred awakened to but I think Jacques Lel is awakening that's awakening. You, you have to wake up. But as uh, as uh, Wilbur says, you also have to grow up. You have to do both. Now, how would this be exhibited? The guru who is actually able to help you in your meditation, and he teaches this class, but he has sex with all the uh, blue-eyed uh, young women. See, that's why... Uh, Wilbur would call waking up, but not growing up. So you have to have both. Uh, so it's not just about meditation, and you'll have these experiences. It's about you have to grow up as well. So there's work to be done in the in, our, in, in the everyday world. It's work to be done on yourself, so that you mature as a human being. Uh, and I think that's his integral spirituality book as opposed to his integral psychology book. But read a 700 pages religious of tomorrow, if you can, and uh, I'm sure if there's a purgatory, you won't go there. Uh, <laughs> if you haven't read that book. But that's an, I think it's an important point. Uh, and Elu, I think, is growing up because he's trying to figure out how religion, spirituality can help save Europe from uh, the mess that it become at the end of, in the 20th century, if you will. Now, to continue on, let's go to our own lives. And so here's a, you don't have to write this down, I wrote this in my little notes. There's a way to look at the, the it's not an active life which is part of growing up, and a contemplative life, if you will, active life, meditation. They kind of can uh, move. So you might, uh, it's a term somebody used, but it's in your bouchon. So now what she's worth reading too, and she's a little bit more understandable. Uh, <laughs> she writes explaining the centering there, Cynthia Bouchot. Uh, any case, there's what you might call lower active. That means you're very active in the world. Okay? So this is Jacques Duell trying to be active in the world, saving Jews from uh, annihilation in World War II. And uh, you're, you're very active doing good works. Okay? You're very active doing good works in the world. You're a kind, loving, caring person. Sort of. But you don't have much of a prayer life. Well, you do have some for your life, but you don't have really much meditation, okay? So that's your active life. Then you can move into, uh, that's lower active. Now you can move into higher active and lower meditation. Or lower meditation. This would be my upbringing in the Catholic Church, for instance. So you're told you should do good works, that you should grow up and not be a selfish, self-centered person. Right? Learn how to do that. Uh, live with others in community, family, siblings, and so on. 
But you should also be doing more than uh, saying prayers. Uh, but you say prayers. So you say prayers, you say rosaries. In my tradition, you say novenas. You go to hear the Latin mass. Uh, you talk to God. You ask God for stuff. Uh, maybe you thank God, and so on and so forth. You have kind of your, your that's your spiritual life, if you will. So it's quite active. Uh, so you're that's uh, so you're still active, but you've got this prayer life, and then um, now you move into something that's called lower contemplation, if you will, or lower meditation. And here's where you begin to, and I learned this later. You uh, you begin to stop in the, in the middle of prayer, so you pray for a little while, you read the scripture, then you see, you, they called it meditation. That is, you kind of think about it, you let it get inside of you. It's called Lectio Divina in, in uh, the Western Christian tradition, where you read the scripture, and then you think about it, you put yourself in the story, and say, how do I fit in there? And then you just find yourself not talking to God or thinking pictures of God, but just sitting there quietly with your thoughts. And uh, so that's to help deepen your life with God. So now you're somewhat active in the world, and now you're lower contemplative. And then the higher contemplative is more uh, what people like Richard Albert, Ron Goss, movie too, but Ken Wilber, Cynthia Bergeau, Thomas Keeney, more of what we nowadays call non-duality. Uh, and that was what Richard uh, Albert had with his pills, the sense of non-duality. But it didn't make him a better person. Um, so um, keep that in mind when you're saying, where am I on the spectrum of spiritual growth in my prayer life? As opposed to, uh, it's all this or all that. Uh, so it can be a combination of things. Uh, but at some point, as you develop, you you have this more direct sense of unity with something that cannot be easily put into words or explained. You have an experience, but it's uh, deeper than something that's easy to explain. And uh, you could call all of Christianity, for instance, you could call it a metaphor. Now, a lot of people think metaphor means you don't think it's true. Uh, Joseph Campbell, the other one, uh, the hero with a thousand faces. Joseph Campbell, the hero with a thousand faces. That was one I read some years ago. So Joseph Campbell is in, uh, invited onto this talk show. All right, going to be interviewed by this person who is a believer, let's say. And uh, so he asked about Christianity and Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell said, well, it's a metaphor. So the guy says, oh, you don't think it's true? He said, no, I didn't say it's not true. I said it's a metaphor. The interviewer thought metaphor meant it's not true. In other words, it absolutely doesn't exist. As you're, but he says, no. And what metaphor means, or what Campbell was trying to say, and I think he's trying to say in his books, is that religion uses language. That's what it tries to do. It's trying to, if you would, connect to your mind with something of an experience, a belief, if you will. So the, uh, the, the Jews, well, they, the Hebrew tribes, they would tell 12 Hebrew tribes, what do you call Jews? They were 12 Hebrew tribes. And uh, it says in the scriptures, of the uh, Hebrew scriptures, that in one night, 400,000 uh, Hebrews crossed the Red Sea. Now, there's no way that 400,000 people are going to cross this not too wide sea. Uh, in a night. But they all cross the sea, and then uh, uh, comes uh, uh, Pharaoh, and they all get stuck and they drown. So people will say, did that really happen? Or didn't it really happen? And uh, 
people like Joseph Campbell say it, it's, that's not what's important. Uh, something happened, okay? Some historical thing happened. And from the historical thing, event, they tried to then, through story uh, and uh, explanation and uh, images, to explain uh, a belief and an experience. So the experience for them is that there is this uh, energy force power that they don't even name, by the way. They don't name it. But eventually we end up calling the God or Yahweh or Jehovah and so on and so forth. That is especially concerned about these people and that they are special people to him. That's the experience that they are trying to explain as metaphor. It doesn't have to be uh, historically accurate. So religion somebody like Joseph Campbell, and I think he's got a lot to say here for, for us to think about, is religion is using language to talk about something that's beyond language. Okay? Something that's beyond concepts. And I think this is what a lot of this non-duality thinking is about. Um, but we're going to use words, and we're going to use pictures and images so that we can talk to everybody about it, uh, but then eventually we want to draw you from that into the non-concept, the non-verbal, the non-words, the non-images through deeper and deeper meditation till ultimately you have an experience of, and again, stuff to come up with words, it's an experience of, say, oneness. It's not I am one with God. I drop out. And this idea of God drops out, but there's a sense of oneness. That would be what you might call non-duality in the present circumstance. Okay. Having said all that, let's go back to Jacques. So he has this experience, but his life's not changed. He hasn't grown up yet. He's had sudden enlightenment, but he's got to work at it. And so he actually begins to live out uh, this growing up in helping the Jews in World War II, for instance. So he's what um, is called a personalist. He's a personalist. Um, well, what's that? It's the idea of being liberated, the liberation of me, the individual, from the control of bureaucracy. Uh, as soon as I let some large group control me, I will stop growing. I may stop growing up, but I'll certainly stop waking up. And so, um, in, you say, well, what, what was his idea with control of bureaucracy in the state? Well, after World War II, you can read a fellow named Tony Jute, J-U-D-T. Tony Jute wrote a book, Post-World War II France, and he also wrote Post-War. And what they were trying to figure out, coming out of World War II, a place like France is, well, how do we run things now? Let's hope not like the way we used to. That didn't get us anywhere. So you kind of, you begin to hear about social democrats, Christian democrats, a Christian social uh, party. It was the idea of Christianity uh, has something to say, certainly about growing up, certainly about our relationship with God, and combine that with a sense of the state, the government. So it was actually not a separation of church and state, which is what we have in the United States. This was very different. It was the state and religion, so it's a certain, you've got an ethics, a morality, a care for one another. Uh, and how do you take a government and make that happen? Well, not 
uh, free run capitalism. That didn't work. Uh, and not fascism. That didn't work. And not atheistic communism. That's going on over in Russia, and Stalin's killing a lot of people. So that's not working. So what we want is this combination. Let's hold on to church, religion. And it's very much a Christian one then. And let's take something of this government, which now uh, is going to be a little bit more socialistic. So the government will now provide the things that used to be provided by your own self or charity or nobody. So you're going to have Christian social democrats. And that was basically kind of parties that, that just ran the government for a while. Well, Elul comes in on all this, who's had this personalistic uh, experience of, um, of a divine, if you will, religious experience, and is now pers has been pursuing that as well as he's did what he could in World War II looking around at many people who didn't do anything in World War II. So uh, he challenges this somewhat uh, because he says, OK, this may take care of some things, uh, but first of all, Christianity is very, um, well, it's big. And it's, uh, it's also controlling. It has dogma. It tells you what's true. It tells you what to believe. And back then, they were still dealing in the Reformation, I think, to some extent, uh, and the Enlightenment, and so on and so forth. So there was this, I'm the right religion, and if you're not in mine, you're wrong, and how do we get around that, and so on and so forth. Let's not kill Jews. Uh, so he says, it's kind of big. And uh, you get to big, and you start telling me who I'm supposed to be and how I'm supposed to live, that's not, I'm on a different plane here. In other words, your dogmatic language will not be enough for me. It's not that it's wrong, it's just that I'm moving on in my own personal experience. And, and organized religion can be the background for that, <coughs> if you will. So, he doesn't want the state to control too much. It's the bureaucracy of the state in which the individual loses his uh, not only sense of self, but part of that sense of, sense of his job. What's my job as an individual? How am I going to be a believer in a meditative life with my neighbor? And what he began to see is people started saying, OK, the government's going to take care of you, not me. I no longer have to deal with your suffering. The government's going to take care of you. And what you begin to lose, and he sees that, is community. You lose a sense of community that he remembers, at least from his younger years, before they get into this. In other words, your little neighborhoods and so on, and your associations and such, you're responsible for the lives of one another. And that's very Christian, but you can get caught up in dogma and say, no, no, I'm not responsible. I'm just on my own personal path to God, which you might call a spiritual awakening, but certainly not growing up. So he says, you've got to hold, he says, we're losing a sense of community. And if anything speaks to the 21st century, it's Joshua. Someone else will take care of you. It's not my job. Um, and he saw that coming on in Europe. And he was trying to remind people of this, uh, the social democratic way. It's not going to be the be all. Uh, for you becoming all that God made you to be, which is in meditation, and in, from that meditation should come a care for the community. So they should be active and contemplative. They should go together. Uh, and he says what he found was 
revolutions, and he didn't want this to become so different that it would become a revolution. He said he looked back on revolutions. Uh, French Revolution, uh, Communism in 1917. Uh, he says, any revolution needs a spiritual consciousness. So this was where he was holding the two together. He said, if we're going to make major changes in how we're going to function as post-World War II Europe, he says, it has to have a spiritual consciousness. And he didn't just say it has to have a religion. He said it has to have a spiritual consciousness, which means we're really not going to grow just by going to church on Sunday or synagogue on Friday or whatever it is you do. He says, because that's not going to change you sufficiently to have the spiritual consciousness that's needed to not only to make me all that I'm supposed to be, but to really be helpful to the people around me, my neighbors, my world, and to the extent that I can, to help them be the best that they're supposed to be, which always has a spiritual dimension to it. You can't just have the welfare state and no belief in God. He didn't, he didn't buy into that at all. He said, that's not going to work. Uh, and you can't just have a dogmatic belief in God without any concern, concern for the person around you. He said, we had that. I saw it in World War II. There were Germans, soldiers, in charge of concentration camps who were going to Mass on Sunday and receiving communion and then going back to the concentration camp. I mean, it has to, it has to work together. So he said, it has to be a spiritual consciousness. Now, you can read a book that's much more current than Tony Jew. It's called Red Notice, R-E-D, Red Notice. Uh, I think it was on the bestseller list as, maybe just a couple of years ago. It's a great book of how communism lacks the spiritual dimension, the spiritual consciousness that it needs. About how, and this is not 1950, 60s Stalin, Khrushchev, this is way later, much more current to how you see how a government functions that has no spiritual consciousness. And uh, we, we don't, we don't want to be there. If you're there, it would be very messy. So, of course, he spoke out in World War II against the Nazis and the Vichy, aided the resistance, hit Jews, hit refugees, and was able to somehow escape it himself. But he wasn't buying into these solutions. Nazis, the Nazis were a solution without a spiritual consciousness. So he says, here's the modern age. Uh, he's not looking at, he's dead in 1994. So here's the modern age, let's say 50s, 60s, 70s, and just keeps growing. He says, there's a loss of community. There's a loss of family, face-to-face -face relationships. Uh, and notice the internet is nowhere near being invented. Already, they, he could see there was this loss of personal interaction that really is going to come, not from going to your church on Sunday, or not just from your church on Sunday. It has to have a deeper dimension. It has to have that one-to-one -one connection with the divine such that it begins to give you a sense, it changes you to the sense that you have an idea of oneness with the world around you. And that's why, not, not non-duality in that way, no, but a sense that what, what we would say in our tradition is that, that person is Christ. I'm going to be rough. That person is Christ. In other words, there's one body of Christ. He came to save all. He didn't just come to save believing Catholics to go to Mass on Sunday. He came to save all. It was that idea. That's therefore the idea of God, whoever that is, trying to put it into words, took on a human dimension to reveal that God is one for all of us, and that's the way we have to live with one another, which we will not do unless you have meditative life, 
that opens you up to connection. What you all saw in the history of religion was that you join a church and you're right and everybody else is wrong. If you read the book Sex, Comedy, and God, Sex, Comedy, God, that was that guy's thing. He spent his, his youth and, and wait until he was about 40, thinking that his job was to convert other people to his way of thinking, otherwise they were going to go to hell. It's very simplistic, but it's, and it's very dualistic. So, Jacques Hillel says, um, in the welfare state, you do not rely on community, you do not rely on the community, you rely on the government. And he says, this is going to be very bad. You will not grow up to all you're supposed to be that way. And so get a spiritual life of some depth, and you will begin to relate to the person next to you much better, basically. So he's very skeptical of anything institutional, be it politics or religion, because they tend to control you. And uh, spirituality is inviting you to let go of uh, that kind of uh, being controlled. Let me go and look at... Uh, let me look at sensory prayer for a minute. Um, I think that the great wisdom of Thomas Keating, who uh, died in a good standing as a Catholic priest in the Trappist uh, Cistercian Benedictine roots of the church last year, um, is the idea it came out of the cloud of unknowing, which was written by a uh, English monk in the 1300s in Stalin. The idea is to pray, learning to pray by letting go. Uh, what are you letting go of? Well, first of all, you're letting go of control. It's a prayer that doesn't really want to control you at all. Uh, you're letting go of your agenda. You're letting go of words and thoughts. The idea be, you don't try to get rid of them. You just learn a method of not paying attention to them so that they at least become background. Because if you go into, uh, I mean, if the mind, and this is where they say the mind, and it's filled with all kinds of thoughts that are going here and going there and so on and so forth, um, it's just too busy. And what you need is to... Get that, let that stuff go to the edges so you're not so conscious of it. You're not so focused on it. And if you can begin to kind of have that let go happen, uh, you will have an experience, the belief is, by the book and by Keating and by people who practice these methods over the years, you will begin to have an experience of some phenomenon but only of presence, let's say. There's something else. Uh, and it's not defined, and it doesn't have uh, uh, edges to it. it uh, there's just something else. Deeper than my thoughts, my feelings, my agenda, and so on and so forth. So all the prayer is trying to do is not to help you get that, it's to help you to, to get, to put aside, to learn how to let go of all the agenda that gets in the way uh, so that you can, well, instead we, we can say, in my tradition, we can say God, but the holy mystery, this is gonna wait, the holy mystery has an opportunity to begin to reveal something of itself that is not about words, concepts, and images, or dogma, which were all ways of talking about this phenomenon called holy mystery, okay? And as the cloud of unknowing says, you will never know this. Knowledge will never bring you to a connection, but love will. So love is the way to access this deeper reality. 
But it's not a love you can think up. But it, you've got it in you. In other words, it's not as if they, it's not as if this divine mystery is standing over here, wherever here is there, let's say, and says, "Oh, well, there's Terry Ryan. He's practicing Saturday prayer, and he's made a little space for me." And then come over here. Ha, ah, Terry, how you doing? Huh? I'm here now. But oh, thoughts. Okay, get down here. Okay, come think your thoughts. Oh, you ready for me again? It's always, this is, I think, what uh, Richard Albert found out is the drug didn't suddenly bring something from outside. His mind was always, or his, his makeup, his phenomenon, his, his, his self, always had the, the uh, sort of spiritual DNA to have this experience of oneness. But he needed a drug to break up all the stuff that got in the way, the surface stuff. When he found out that the drug did it for a moment, but it didn't make him a, grow up. It didn't make him a better person. And what he wanted was the whole picture. He wanted to become love. And he realized that drug wasn't going to do it. Meditation could, because he saw the Maharishi sheep. Uh, and he said, I, I want that. So, Centering prayer is a way of availing us of a, of a presence that is always um, accessible and always part of us. But we cannot get to it because the way our minds function and our feelings and so on and so forth. But it's there. So what centering prayer tries to do with its sacred word is to just uh, not pay attention to the static, so you can have a uh, open your, so you can be open. You can be open. So in a sense, it's giving a total control, so that you can access something. Uh, and so with uh, somebody like uh, um, Jacques Ulel, he says, if you let the government have total control sort of like that mind that thinks. He said, you will never access the unity that's right there between you and your neighbor. So he's taking the, 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 the meditative end of it and trying to apply it to daily life, which is Ken Wilber would say, waking up, growing up. Um, so in, in the centering prayer, we're letting go to, of our agenda so that we can have a, again, it's, it's words, a deeper relationship with a, with a mystery that is always within us. And it's more important that we, that we allow that reality to become more apparent and begin to change us. And Yulel, I think, felt that you would be changed from that to where you would keep in touch with your neighbor. Community was important, and the government couldn't do everything. It could do a better job than what was happening before the wars, but it couldn't do everything. So he's skeptical of anything institutional, be it politics or religion. And uh, somebody that I have talked about is uh, Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard said, personal experience is crucial. Organized religion is not going to do it. And these are all believers. They wouldn't give it up on God. <laughs> and, but, so he was a Christian existentialist, if you will. The right here now experience of the divine is what we want to open ourselves to on a daily basis. Uh, direct, personal relationship with God through a, deep, a deepening, deepening meditation so that we then practice our faith, if you will, in a concrete, everyday manner. Uh, so it's not about sitting for three hours in Zazen and ignoring the suffering of the world. Uh, it's about both. About, maybe not three hours, but it's this connection. You know, I was trying to make the connection. I think a lot of the modern uh, 
mystics, uh, people who open mystic people who open themselves to this deeper reality that's always there. Uh, and so when um, so Albert is so moved by Maharishi Ji as a person. He said he could feel it, he could sense it, this, this change, this love that this man, un uh, just completely accepting Richard Alpert as Richard Alpert at the time, which was, you know, he wasn't very deeply formed at all at the moment. But it was because he was so attracted, uh, she became his guru because of who, the way, the energy that that man had when Alpert was with him attracted him. That's how, now, I'll go over to my tradition. For a moment, I'll, if you're not, I'll say, so Jesus of Nazareth is walking along the shore, and he sees a bunch of fishermen, and he says, come follow me. And they drop their nets and follow him. Why? What did he say? Well, you see, if we just stay in our heads, we think, we didn't say anything. Or I've seen this. Say, well, they, they all knew him. They all knew him from his teaching and so on and so forth. No, it was him. What was he doing in those first thirty years? Well, what was Maharishi Ji doing for years? He was practicing this spiritual path, such that, as John, the, the guy who wrote the Gospel, John, a, uh, God is love. And so there was, which is a verb, not a noun, in a place. It's a verb. It's energy. And he, Jesus exuded this energy, and it attracted them right away. And then you saw how Jesus would go about doing things. So, let's say maybe another example. Uh, I think it was in one of the daily meetings recently. So, uh, Oh, Jesus goes into a town. And this uh, widow is um, going out with the casket of her dead son. And she's got no other children, so on and so forth. And so you read the gospel and it says, well, he took pity on her. And so he said, stop. He touches it. And son wakes up and starts talking. And... Uh, Here's a way to look at that. Jesus is going about, and from our position, he's going about saying nice things, saying wonderful things, uh, saying challenging things, and uh, but you don't know what's going on inside. How's he seeing the world? And possibly... And as I listen to some of these people talk who have, who have had really moved more into the sense of the non-dual, the interconnectedness, they see things that we don't see. And so Jesus walks along and he sees that, he sees something about him that's supposed to be alive or is not dead. Or, uh, we only know alive and dead. And he says, wait. He says, the reality is he's going, he sees it. He doesn't see sequentially. He sees you. Know, he sees oneness. And so we ask, because why didn't he raise every dead person around? So the, 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 the few statements we get from uh, somebody like Jesus Christ in, that are written down in the scriptures all seem to have in common a different way of looking at the same people that the institutional religion people look. They see sinner to be avoided. See, that's, that's chopping up, separating. I'm in, you're out. And Jesus sees something else. Uh, so it isn't just that he's, he's merciful, he's kind, he's compassionate. He has a whole different idea of the insides of anybody as well as uh, their potential, 
and his interconnectedness with them. Uh, and it's, we can't get there just by reading about it. But we can read about it and ponder it from an historical perspective. We can meditate on it and say, I'm challenged to be a better person and kinder, more forgiving, more compassionate. And someday, if you pursue this meditation, the light will go on and you'll begin to see and experience reality as Jesus did. Um, and you'll probably look and say, I, I knew nothing.